defense to give a reason for anyone who asks the reason for our hope. The reason for our hope is that Christ is risen from the dead. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at how we can be equipped to give an answer, a defense of the resurrection, the fact of the resurrection. Most non-Christians think the resurrection is just a myth, just a fairy tale, just something that Christians made up. Maybe the early church made it up to make themselves feel better. Um, But we're going to spend some time this morning looking at evidence and arguments that show that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead as a fact of history, not just an article of faith. Our, Our culture likes to divide articles of faith from facts of history and say, well, articles of faith are whatever you want to believe. You can believe, you know, that, you know, anything you want to believe because it's just a belief that has nothing to do with real life. But Jesus really rose again from the dead in history at a real place, at a real point in time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you that in Jesus we have salvation because he died for our sins, because he rose again from the dead, because he is alive forevermore and coming again to judge the living and the dead. We have a sure, unshakable, eternal hope. Be with us now and help us to think clearly about the resurrection. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to give you seven arguments for the resurrection of Jesus. If you know anything about me, and you know anything about numbers in the Bible, it probably won't surprise you that I'm saying seven arguments for the resurrection of Jesus and three key reasons why it matters. But you may also be able to anticipate that there's a surprise coming. Here are the seven arguments for the resurrection of Jesus. First of all, the fact that scriptures foretold the resurrection hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. Second, the reality that Jesus was crucified by the Romans under the authority of Pontius Pilate. Third, the fact that the tomb was and is empty. Fourth, multiple eyewitnesses and multiple appearances. And then fifth, the fact that many of the key eyewitnesses were willing to die for the truth of their testimony Sixth, the fact that the early church came to believe this to be true. And then seventh, the fact that the day of worship was changed for God's people. So first, scriptures foretold the resurrection. Two of the most powerful chapters in all the Bible are Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 because we know they were written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. We have copies of them in the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in 1947. We have copies of them that predate Jesus and his life. This right here is an image of the Isaiah scroll. It's very significant that of all of the scrolls that came out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls, 1947, a Bedouin shepherd boy was out watching over his flock of goats in the Judean wilderness, and as teenage boys are prone to do, he started picking up rocks and throwing them, and there was a cave high up on the side of a cliff, and he thought it would be a good game to see if he could get his rock inside that cave. I mean, come on, you're 15 years old, you're out watching sheep in the middle of the desert wilderness, who wouldn't do that, right? So he's just playing a game, and all of a sudden he throws one, and he hears it hit something, And he hears that something break. Now, Tyler, what would you do? Go find out what it was, was, right? (laughs) Like, duh. (laughs) So he goes and he finds out what it was. And it's these jars that have been kept in this cave in this dry environment for 2,000 years. Untouched. And inside are scrolls. Hundreds and hundreds of scrolls. And it's not just that cave, but there's a whole series of caves in that area that all have these clay jars that inside are scrolls. They found scrolls of every book of the Hebrew Bible. And they found lots of other scrolls, too, of the writing of this religious community called the Essenes. And we actually learned a lot about the Essenes from this archaeological discovery. One of the things we learned 
that helps us understand the Bible is that John the Baptist was almost certainly part of the Essene community. The description of John the Baptist and the description of the community line up perfectly. And so, of all the scrolls of Hebrew Bible that were taken out, there's only one that was kept intact. Who knows anything about cars? If you have a used car, can you make more money selling that used car whole or having it professionally disassembled and selling off the parts individually? Parts. You can make a lot more money. Okay? Same thing with ancient scrolls. Somebody will pay you a million dollars for a piece of a Dead Sea Scroll. They might pay you five million for the whole of it. But if you can break it up into 20 parts, you're going to make four times as much money. That's what happened to every other Old Testament or Hebrew Bible scroll. They were all broken up into parts except for one. Only one was left intact, and that is the image of it. And it is the Isaiah scroll. Only the book of Isaiah was left intact. And so we know there were lots of theories about Isaiah before this, theories from critical people, people who didn't like the Bible, people who said Christians added to the book of Isaiah later. Isaiah 53 isn't original. It was added later by Christians to make it sound more Christian. Or the first part of Isaiah was written by one author, and then the second part of Isaiah that we're going to start next week was written by some different author hundreds of years later. Well, here we have intact scroll of Isaiah. It is actually in two pieces that were sewn together, but it's sewn together at the midpoint of the book, which is not chapter 40, and it's just because it's such a long book that they didn't have a piece that was big enough. So this gives us good evidence that Isaiah 53 is original. It's pre-Christian. It was in the Bible. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. What has happened to the Messiah at this point in Isaiah 53? He was cut off out of the land of the living. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. What has happened to the Messiah at this point? He's dead and he's buried, right? When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Wait, I thought he was dead and buried. He must be alive again. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. So the fact that he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see and be satisfied, and he will have a portion to divide with the strong. Is, means he's alive again. He died, he was buried, but he is alive again, and he's victorious. He gets the victor's share of the one who has conquered. Psalm 42, or sorry, Psalm 22 gives us the most graphic description of the experience of Jesus on the cross, even though it was written by King David a thousand years before he was born. King David wrote what it was like for Jesus on the cross, what he suffered, how he felt. He wrote it down a thousand years before Jesus was even born. Is that humanly possible? No, that is not humanly possible. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. That's what happens when you are crucified because you're nailed to the cross and then tied to the cross and then the cross is lifted up and dropped into the ground and your shoulders and elbows get dislocated by the weight of your body dropping 
It's a physical description of what happens. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. The extreme thirst. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Roman crucifixion, which involved piercing the hands and feet of the one being crucified, would not even be invented for hundreds of years after this psalm was written. There was no known method of execution in the world that involved the piercing of hands and feet when David wrote this psalm. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. It's a graphic and vivid description of Jesus on the cross. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, come to my help. Come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. You have rescued me is the turning point of Psalm 22. Horns of the wild oxen may be a reference to a sacrificial altar that would have horns on it, or it may be just a reference to the power of the men who are killing him. But, but it is you have rescued me, and then I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Where did Jesus go in the evening on the day of his resurrection? Do you know where he went, where he appeared that evening? Where's that? To the disciples in the upper room, in the midst of the congregation, to tell his brothers, the disciples, about what God had done. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. Now, Hebrews interprets this and says that Jesus cried out to the Lord during the days of his flesh with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. So he was heard. He was rescued. He appeared to his brothers. This was all written down a thousand years before Jesus was born. And here's one more, just for good measure, because everything should be established by two or three witnesses. So we have Isaiah, we have David, and now we have Zechariah. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. I believe this was at least partially fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, when God poured out the Spirit, and the crowd that was gathered together that day, Peter told them, you took Jesus and you crucified him by the foreordination of God. You took him and you crucified him. And they were cut to the heart, and they said, Brothers, what must we do to be saved? And so they were told. They wept over him. Now look, this is the Lord speaking. This is the Lord speaking. He says, I will pour out on the house of David a spirit of grace and please, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, that tells us that Jesus is the Lord of the Old Testament, Yahweh, in human form. When they look on me, the one whom they have pierced, all right, fact number two, Jesus was crucified. So whether Christian, Jewish, or non-religious, almost all historians and scholars agree that the baptism of Jesus by John and the crucifixion of Jesus under Pontius Pilate are clearly established facts. So even people who don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, who don't really believe in the resurrection, if they're a serious historian of the ancient world and they take anything seriously about how you do ancient history, they know and agree that Jesus was baptized by John, in the River Jordan, and he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And the reasons why they believe that is, first of all, there's a lot of documentary evidence for it. 
including from non-Christian sources like Josephus, but also this is not something you would make up. You wouldn't make up either one of these things. If you were trying to convince people in the ancient world that your man was the Messiah, the Savior, you would not have them either baptized by John or crucified. Because in most people's minds, if he was baptized by John, that means he was less than John. That's why the gospel writers explain to us that that's not what was happening in the baptism. But to be crucified is actually the most horrific death in the Roman world. It was so shameful that it was not spoken of among polite Roman company. It was not even to be thought of. It was so shameful and so horrible. If you were trying to sell the Roman world on a Messiah, the last thing you would do, the very last thing you would do, is say that your Messiah was crucified. It's absurd. And so there's no way they would fabricate that. And so it almost certainly happened. Bethany Lutheran College says the crucifixion of the Jesus of Nazareth is among the most well-documented events in the ancient world. Within 100 years of the event, 10 Christians, three Romans, and one Jew all wrote of it in the historical accounts they produced. This was not the stuff of oral legend. It was first century historiography by the best scholarly standards, interviewing eyewitnesses, corroborating their reports with publicly verifiable facts. The historical record agrees perfectly with what the Christian church confesses in the Apostles' Creed. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Well, that's from a Christian college, but it's not just Christians who agree on this. Bart Ehrman, who's probably one of the most prominent scholars critical of Christianity, he's anti-Christian, he says one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on the orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. Again, he doesn't believe in the resurrection. He doesn't believe that Jesus is the son of God, but he says it's one of the most certain facts of history. It's there with like George Washington being president, Napoleon sweeping over Europe. It is a well-established fact that he was crucified. Gerd Liedman, who is an atheist, says that Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. So they both agree that he died by crucifixion, but you realize that without the resurrection, it doesn't really do much of anything, but at least it would have proved that he truly died. There's no evidence of anyone ever surviving a Roman crucifixion. That didn't happen. These were professionals. They knew what they were doing, and it was a particularly brutal way to kill someone. You didn't, you didn't walk away from it. There's one theory of the resurrection is that Jesus just sort of passed out on the cross and then being put into a cave for a couple of days with no medical attention, somehow he had enough strength to get up and move aside the stone and uh, be okay. Um, no, you don't, you, you don't walk away from a crucifixion. But also, we know that even if, even if we want to say that the resurrection didn't happen, the disciples believed that he rose again because they wouldn't talk about the crucifixion unless they believed that he rose again. Short video. Do we have sound? What is the evidence Jesus rose from the dead? Can we have any confidence in an event 2,000 years ago? Well, let me lay out some quick facts that we know and why the resurrection of Jesus best accounts for these. Number one, we know that Jesus died on the cross. There's essentially no scholarly debate about this. How can I make such a claim? Well, number one, it's all over the New Testament in a number of different writers. Number two, we have extra biblical Christian writers in the end of the first century, early, and early second century, people like Ignatius and Clement of Rome. And then we have non-Christian writers, Romans like Tacitus, early second century, Jews like Josephus at the end of the first century. And not to mention, the Christians wouldn't make up that their Messiah was crucified because it meant on its surface that that person was shamed, in a sense, by God. So we know Jesus died on the cross. Well, how do we know the tomb was empty? Well, a few reasons. Number one, have you ever noticed the tomb was discovered by women? Now, in that culture, a woman's testimony in most circumstances was considered worthless. They didn't, a woman was not educated in the sense like a man was. So why would the apostles invent that women discovered the empty tomb unless it were really true? 
But second, if you read in the Gospels, you know what it says? The religious leaders, when they're trying to discount the resurrection, one thing they say is the disciples came and stole the body. Now, I don't believe the disciples stole the body, but why would the religious leaders make that up? Because the body was gone and the tomb was empty. So Jesus died, the tomb is empty, and third, we have appearances of Jesus. We have Jesus appearing to Paul, who was persecuting Christians. We have Jesus appearing to the 500 that's recorded in 1 Corinthians 15. He appears to women. He appears to James, his brother, who did not believe during his lifetime, and he appears to the 12. And then finally, the apostles, who were the first eyewitnesses of this and record it, were all willing to suffer and willing to die for this conviction. Now that alone doesn't show that it's true, but it shows they really believed it. Friends, Jesus lived. He died on the cross. The tomb is empty. We have radical accounts of Jesus appearing to people. And then our first witnesses were willing to suffer and die and refused to give up that belief, even though they were threatened with their very own lives, which we see in the beginning of Acts. For those reasons and many more, we have a good case to be made that Jesus really rose from the grave. All right. So the tomb was empty. Um, one of the stunning facts is that the gospel writers name the tomb. They don't just say, oh, he was buried in a nearby tomb. They say he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a member of the Sanhedrin and who was one of the wealthiest and most prominent people in all of Jerusalem. Everyone would have been able to check and see if Joseph of Arimathea's tomb was actually empty. They also specified that it was a newly cut tomb that had never been used. And so you don't, one of the things, even with the Gospels, people say, well, the Gospels, they're just Christian scripture and they were just made up by the church. No, they weren't just made up by the church because they contain such specific historical details that if you're just making up a story, you don't put those in there because it's too easy to check the facts and verify or falsify the claim. If you're making up something, you keep it very vague and very nonspecific. That way it can't be verified or falsified. But they named the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. They named the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And I am convinced that I have actually been to that tomb twice. And the reason is an interesting reason why I'm convinced that this is the real tomb. And that is in 135 AD. So think about it, about 100 years after Jesus died and rose again. In 135 AD, the Roman emperor Hadrian, who was a pagan, who hated Jews, who hated Christians, the Roman Emperor Hadrian had a temple to Jupiter built in Jerusalem over top of the empty tomb to stop Christians from going there on pilgrimage. So, so many Christians had a long established tradition of going to this particular cave on pilgrimage as the empty tomb by the year 135 that Hadrian says, I got to put a stop to this. We're going to put a temple to Jupiter right there. He also, by the way, he built a Roman garden over top of the cave that Christians had been going on pilgrimage to as the cave where Jesus was born. So a pagan persecuting the church secured the locations of his birth and of his resurrection so that later when Christians wanted to build churches, they knew exactly where to build the churches because they had been desecrated by, uh, by Hadrian. They've recently done excavations, by the way, um, in the chapel, under the chapel, and they did find at least the slab that was laid in the 300s when the first Christian church was built there, and they did some ultrasound of the walls, and they found that there were walls that go up, but the one wall curves up a little bit, like there had been a, there had been a, a top to it. So the theory of what happened is that... Um, when they built the church there, they cut away the hillside to be able to build a church there, but it had it already been at the location of a temple of Jupiter, so it may have been Hadrian who cut that away. But this is the site of Christ's tomb. Um, we know that burial chambers existed there in the first century B.C. and A.D. By the way, if you ever do get a chance to go to Israel, and if I'm not with you on that trip, uh, they'll probably take you to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is this one, and then they'll take you to the Garden Tomb, which is further away, 
The garden tomb is the place where evangelicals like to go because it's, it feels more like the original setting of being a garden-like setting and where there are tombs. But excavations done at the garden tomb have shown that those tombs date back to 800 BC. So they would not have been newly cut tombs that had never been used by the time of Jesus. Um, and this, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre just has a much longer and stronger history. This, this spot right here, like I said, that's where Hadrian built the Temple of Jupiter in 135. That's where he was st trying to stop Christians from going. And that's where the church, Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Church of the Nativity are the two oldest churches in the world. They both date from the early 300s. <coughs> that video. All right. So despite the fact that the tomb was empty, no guards were executed, the body of Jesus was never recovered, and none of the disciples was arrested and executed for breaking into the tomb and stealing the body. The religious leader said he stole the body. They stole the body. Well, if you think they stole the body, you would arrest them. You would put them on trial. That's a crime. They didn't do that. If, if Roman guards fell asleep and allowed the disciples to come in and steal the body, those Roman guards would be executed because the penalty for falling asleep on the job as a Roman guard was death. It's what kept them awake. <laughs> and if they stole the body, where is the body? It was never recovered. And boy, did they have every incentive to try to find that body. There were multiple appearances and multiple eyewitnesses 1 Corinthians 15, we know, was written about 25 to 27 years after. It's actually the earliest account of the resurrection. And here, again, Paul gets very specific. Verse 5, he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James that is James, the younger half-brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James. And then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So we have over 514 witnesses, many of whom are named specifically. And this is only 25 to 27 years after the resurrection that we know this was written. Not only are witnesses named... But many of the earliest eyewitnesses were put under pressure to deny what they had seen or be executed. Now, the truth is that many later Christians did deny Christ under the Roman persecutions, because if you're not 100% confident of something, you're not going to die for it. You will generally say, I'd rather live. So that, that's the truth. Most, actually, most Christians who were arrested under Roman persecution, ended up denying Christ so that they could be set free. But none of the apostles did. None of them. If it was a conspiracy that they had made up, that they were selling to the world, somebody would have cracked. People don't die for what they know to be a lie. Now, some people say, well, Muslim jihadists, they die for a lie all the time. Yes, they die for a lie, but they're convinced that that lie is truth. These are eyewitnesses. They're being put under pressure for something they said they saw. We saw Christ risen again. People don't die for something they know is a lie. James, the brother of John and the son of Zebedee, was killed by a sword. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. They clearly believed that what they saw, they saw and they were convinced of the truth of it. We know... I have to skip that. So number six, I'm not going to do the video, but just that the early church came to believe it, and the point of this one is, Jesus wasn't the only person to come along in Israel in the first century claiming to be the Messiah. There were at least 12 that we know of. All of them died. And after they died, all of their movements ended and their followers dispersed. Why did the early church keep meeting together and keep worshiping and keep spreading the gospel so that within the lifetime of the apostles, it had spread as far as Spain and India and Ethiopia? Why would they be so committed if the guy had died and stayed dead? 
the fact that the early church believed this and was so committed to it, it, it gives weight to the fact that they had seen him alive again. And the seventh is that the day of worship was changed. But to realize for almost 2,000 years, believers had always gathered on the last day of the week, and then they started gathering on the first day of the week. And they started calling the first day of the week the Lord's Day. Acts 20, first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, first day of the week. And Revelation 1, it's the first day of the week, and John calls it the Lord's Day. You don't change the day of worship after 2,000 years unless something phenomenal happened to make that day holy, holier than creation, new creation, resurrection. It's the only thing that could change the day of worship. Okay, number eight, bonus surprise, because number eight is the number of new beginnings or resurrection. The apostles worshiped Jesus as God. This was a man they ate with. This was a man they slept alongside. This was a man they got in the boat and sailed across the Sea of Galilee with. And during his lifetime, they often doubted him, often disobeyed him, often challenged him. But then they're calling him God. That doesn't happen without a resurrection. Waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thomas, my Lord and my God. That requires something to make a man that you are friends with and have spent years of your life with to all of a sudden believe that he is God. Only the resurrection does that. So three reasons why it matters, and then we'll close. Number one, death has been defeated. Number two, Jesus' payment for sin has been accepted. And number three, we live in the power of the resurrection. The immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe is according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. This is really what, the, what our sermon is about today. The fact that we, the power of God works in us, that which is pleasing in his sight because Jesus rose again from the dead. And it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead that is now at work in us. This gives us every reason to rejoice, and this gives us every reason to confidently proclaim the resurrection of Jesus to the world, even if the world thinks we're crazy. Let them think we're crazy. We need to keep telling them the good news of what God has done in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of the resurrection. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Thank you for the hope that nothing in this world can take away because Jesus is alive forevermore. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, in joy and in confidence, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.